so yesterday, uh, so the last uh, topic was the exploration exploitation dilemma in reinforcement learning. So uh, yeah, when we look at our algorithm, a very important question is here um, how to choose the next action in Q learning. And I mean, the good news is for the convergence proof, it does not matter. So we have a convergence guarantee of uh, Q learning um, whenever we use a fair action selection strategy. Fair means that in an infinitely long sequence, all actions have to be selected infinitely often. Yeah? So whenever we do this, uh, we have convergence, but um, it's a matter of speed. How long does it take until we have a good policy? And this uh, strongly depends on how we select our actions. Yeah? And uh, so there are t two extreme possibilities. The one is uh, random ex action selection. That's what we call exploration because we randomly explore the, the space of all policies. And the other extreme uh, uh, choice would be exploitation. That means we always select the best action. Yeah? And uh, in practice, what people do is something in between. I, um, I mentioned the epsilon greedy strategy where with a certain probability of epsilon, we always select a random action. And this epsilon typically is, should not be too, too large. So yeah, the simplest strategy is to work with a constant epsilon. And then epsilon would be something like 0.1. Yeah? But it's even better to adapt, uh, adaptively uh, choose the epsilon depending on how far we have gone in the convergence. Yeah? So at the beginning, we use epsilon equal one. So we only do random uh, action selection. And when our Q function starts converging, then we decrease epsilon. Yeah? And I mentioned uh, the PhD thesis of uh, Mr. Tokic, who works exactly on this topic. OK, yeah. Um, yeah, then I guess we stopped here, yes. Um, um, so the algorithms I presented up to this point were just uh, based on discrete states and actions. Huh? So we have a discrete and finite, important. Not only discrete, but finite. So we have a finite number of states, a finite number of actions, and then it is, I mean, then it's no, pro no problem to store the Q function explicitly. I mean, our Q function, Q of S and A, if there is a finite number of states and a finite number of actions, then uh, I can store this Q function in a two-dimensional array. Huh? Uh, I mean, this array may be higher dimensional, but it is a finite uh, dimensional array. Suppose the state is a three-dimensional vector, then already uh, here we have three dimensions and the actions are maybe six-dimensional, then we have a nine-dimensional array. But we can store all Q values. Huh? But if the state space is infinite, and maybe even the action space, then we can't store the Q function anymore. And what we do then, I already showed you yesterday. What will we do then? How will we now store our Q function? We use function approximation. Uh, so uh, Q now is a black box with input S 
and A, and the output is Q of S and A. I mean, it's a function as we know it from mathematics. If you take the cosine function, then of course it kind of stores infinitely many x values. Huh? Whenever you input an x, you get as an output the cosine. Whenever you input state and action, you get as an output the q value. Huh? Um, you may use a neural network or other function approximation techniques. Um, and once this neural network is trained, this black box contains the Q function. That's it. And how will you train it? It will be trained during the learning process. During the learning process, I, uh, we will get again and again uh, Q values for some uh, state and action, state action pairs. And these are our training patterns. So we will have maybe 10,000 training patterns and finally we will have approximated the Q function. Uh, and this approximated Q function will then be valid for infinitely many possible state action pairs. Okay, so we will use function approximation uh, in order to store our Q function. Or, I mean, the same thing can be done for value iteration where we have a value function which only depends on the state and not on the action. Okay, yeah, that's what we see here. Q table is replaced by a neural network with input variables S and A and Q value as output. We have, yeah, that's important, we have a finite representation of an infinite function. Yeah? Of course, if this is maybe, this is a neural network and then the, the representation of the network are the weights, maybe it has 100 weights and that's finite, of course. And, yeah, that's also important, we have the, uh, the generalization capabilities of such a function. That's very important. Um, look. Suppose we have a one-dimensional state space. If this state space is discrete, I have one, two, three, four states. And uh, here we draw our value function V of S. And maybe for this state we have this value, for this state we have this value, here we have this value, and here we have this. And now the problem is that in a discrete space, here the function is not continuous. We have a jump from this value to this value. Um, and even worse, suppose we don't know this value. We just know these three values because during our learning process the agent never visited this state. Now in the discrete space I have no idea about this value. Because it is a discrete space, because there are no continuity assumptions on our function, we have no idea about what happens here. But if we do function approximation, then based on these three values, we may get a function that looks like that. And immediately we get a value here. We don't know whether it's correct, but maybe it's better to have such a value than nothing. So you see, uh, as soon as we work on continuous spaces, um, we get a generalization. We have these two values and from the function approximation we get a smooth function in between. But if we work on the discrete space, we cannot assume something like continuity and so on. Uh, so even, even if we work on the discrete space, it may be a good idea to use function approximation to fill the gaps in between the points we have. Yeah? So function approximation 
is not only necessary when we have infinite spaces, it may be a good idea even in discrete spaces because uh, we don't need to collect so many training data. We need data for a part of the space and maybe here we have a gap, it will, be, it will automatically be filled. And if these gaps are not too large, it's no problem. I mean, of course, if in this tiny space we would have only this one point and nothing else, then of course it would be hard to get an idea about what happens here. So we need a sufficient number of training data and then our function approximation will fill all the gaps. So that's what we mean here with generalization. Okay, but the downside is um, we have no more convergence guarantee. Huh? Um, yeah. Because we are no longer able to visit all the state action pairs infinitely often. Okay, uh, yes, and also, of course, I already mentioned, it doesn't need to be a neural network. You can use any function approximation technique. And we will see in the math lecture in the next few lectures, uh, for example, uh, the least squares method, which is a very powerful method, and it's kind of related to neural networks, but in many cases it's much easier to solve. Okay, yeah. Um, another extension of what we did up to now is the so-called uh, uh, partially observable Markov decision process. Um, up to now we just talked about deterministic Markov decision processes and non-deterministic too, but here we have a partially observable Markov decision process. That's in many real world applications like in robotics where the robot does not know the exact state of the world. Maybe part of if the robot would have to work in this room, parts of the room are hidden. Uh, for example, I don't know what's below the table. So I don't know the perfect state of this world. Huh? Um, yeah, and uh, so this makes these algorithms like Q-learning um, kind of difficult because we lose convergence guarantee. And uh, I mean, there are different algorithms for partially observable Markov decision processes. I don't go into details here. Okay, yeah, let me talk about a, f a famous application, which is TD Gammon. Huh? We already know the TD, that's, that comes from temporal difference learning. I showed you the basic simple formula. Um, in TD Gammon, they used um, an extension of TD learning, it's called TD Lambda, where they not only consider one step in the future, but they have a parameter lambda where they can consider a certain amount of future uh, look ahead. Yeah? Okay, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, and you can see from the gammon, it is about the backgammon game. Yeah? Um, backgammon is a board game for two players and it, uh, it involves non-determinism because uh, the, the players uh, in every round, they roll a dice. So there is some random influence, some non-determinism. And um, yeah, uh, the, the person who invented this was an American called Tesauro. Um, and he, uh, he used a TD learning to train a computer playing uh, backgammon. Um, but maybe we should motivate why we use, why he used reinforcement learning. I mean, that's, that's the problem in game playing all the time. Um, suppose you would like to train with supervised learning techniques a backgammon agent. Then you would need to provide training data. Huh? And training data, what would that mean? You would need a file containing one column 
which is the state of the game. Yeah? So you would need to know the exact state of the board and this would be encoded in, in such a variable. I mean typically it will be a number of variables. So you would encode the state of the game and then of course you need the label which is the action that uh, the player has to take. Yeah. yeah. Um, and oh yeah, and maybe in backgammon, of course, you should also know the outcome of the dice, yeah? and then the action of the player. So you would need data like that, and uh, and so on. If you can provide such a file of training data for your computer agent, then you could apply some learning algorithm. One of these we, we, we have seen, like a perceptron or a backpropagation or nearest neighbor method or decision tree learning. You can use either one of these learning algorithms. You just apply it to these training data and you will have finally a function f mapping state and the dice outcome onto a good action. That's easy. We can do it with supervised learning. But what is the great disadvantage of this method? Imagine you would have the task of training such an agent. The problem is collecting training data. And now if you would play yourself, the whole thing depends on whether you are an excellent backgammon player or not. So if you, are, if you are not a good backgammon player, then your agent would learn to play as bad as you are. Huh? Uh, so then the better choice would be to find an excellent backgammon player and to convince this person to play thousands of games and write down all your moves. And I mean, maybe you're lucky and find such a, a patient player who would uh, spend weeks, uh, maybe even months, providing these training data. But I mean, that costs a lot of money. If you would have to pay this person for all his, uh, his work, that's uh, very costly. So maybe it's cheaper to let the computer collect the training data and that's then reinforcement learning. That's the reason why uh, reinforcement learning, um, or let me say that's the advantage of reinforcement learning. Um, okay, so the problem is, the problem is collecting these actions here. We don't have them. If we don't have the excellent backgammon player which, who is uh, very patient and takes a lot of time, then we don't have the actions. Of course we can collect uh, states and, and dice rolls. We can produce them automatically, but that doesn't help us anything. Yeah? Okay, now, let's, now we do reinforcement learning and what, what Tesoro did um, he had his uh, backgammon program playing against itself. I mean, it's no problem on the computer to have two copies of the backgammon agent. And he let this backgammon agent uh, play against his own clone. Huh? And uh, I mean, how many, how many games did it? Oh, 1.5 million games against itself. 1.5 million games. Huh? It's, it was possible for this computer agent, but that would be impossible with a human uh, player. Uh, 
Um, and during these games, playing against itself. I mean, now we are talking about reinforcement learning. Yeah, I mean, uh, he did TD learning, uh, but I mean, it could, it could also be Q learning. Uh, assume for the moment he would use Q learning because that's easier and you know the details of the algorithm. Um, now the question is, the really crucial point in Q learning is the immediate reward function. The reward function R of S and A. That's the crucial point. How do we, in such a reinforcement learning example, define this reward function? Remember our crawling robot? The reward function was how the wheel turns. It gets a positive reward whenever it moves forward, negative reward whenever it moves backward. Now, how would we, in the backgammon game, define this reward function? That's a crucial question. Suppose you would uh, learn to play backgammon. But there is no trainer, no teacher, no person who tells you, I mean, you, of course you know the rules of the game, but you don't know anything about strategy. There is no teacher. You just have an opponent, but this opponent uh, does not help you. Where do you get your uh, reinforcement, your reward from? From winning and losing. Yeah, from winning and losing the games. That's it. So you will get, maybe, maybe the game is, I don't know, a backgammon game, maybe it's 100 moves. And only after the last move, when you win or lose, you get a reinforcement. That's it. And that's the issue about uh, reinforcement learning. And now you can imagine why this computer needed to have 1.5 million games. Because it's all a matter of statistics. When you lose your backgammon game, <coughs> It, it does not mean that all your moves uh, were bad moves. Maybe it was just one move somewhere in the middle of the game which was very bad and the rest was good. Or maybe you win the game just because uh, your opponent was very bad and your, your, your play wasn't go quite good in this one particular game. But over many games, uh, with a lot of statistics, then you may get the insight, oh, maybe this is not good because whenever I use this move, I lose the game. So you, you need to do statistics. And that's why uh, in reinforcement learning, uh, such an agent needs very, very many training cycles. Okay, yeah, but finally, um, okay, yeah. So you see, you see, he used TD learning using a backpropagation network. So now why did he use a backpropagation network? Yeah, just because that's what I mentioned uh, before, to store the Q function, to get a good generalization. Uh, so he used backpropagation as the function approximator for the Q function. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, and uh, f uh, the result wasn't too bad. So his agent was better than some backgammon grandmasters, which is not too bad. So that, uh, actually that means it was better than almost every backgammon player. Okay, yeah, other applications of reinforcement learning. Um, actually, there are not too many real-world uh, applications of reinforcement learning now.
because it's still an ongoing field of research and it's a very hard problem. It's computationally very expensive. Um, so not too many companies nowadays invest money in doing reinforcement learning, but they start doing it. Yeah? So it's, but it's mainly in the academic community. It has been used in RoboCup. Um, for example, there is the group of uh, Professor Riedmiller. Um, he was in University of Osnabrück, but now he moved down south. Uh, I guess he is in Darmstadt, or is he in Freiburg? Somewhere in Baden-Württemberg. Yeah. He has an excellent group, uh, and they use uh, neural networks for reinforcement learning. Um, and he, he, is, uh, he has the best uh, RoboCup team in Germany, and he won a couple of uh, RoboCup tournaments. And when you watch uh, his team, um, the name of his team is the Brainstormers. When you watch his team playing, it's really impressive how good their skills are. For example, uh, such a, I mean, these, these RoboCup middle size agents, they are robo robots of about this size. They just move around on wheels on the ground. And uh, I mean, how do they control the ball? They just push the ball in front of them. And, and his uh, agents, his robots, they are very, very skilled in, in dribbling, in moving the ball. So the, the robot looks like kind of a triangle, and in front there are two kind of little sticks like that, and the ball is just moved around by pushing it uh, in front of the robot. And now, if the robot uh, wants to move on a curve like this, then typically what happens is the robot moves around like that, but the ball will continue moving in this direction. Yeah? Um, and now, I mean, this is, this is not easy to program that the robot still controls the ball while moving around the corner. So the robot would actually have to move kind of uh, on a circle around the ball. So in the next step, the robot should be uh, somewhere here. Um, and then he would get the ball around the corner. And programming this is very hard. And what he did is they used uh, reinforcement learning to learn the dribbling behavior. And that's really impressive. Um, yes, a, a classical benchmark is the inverse pendulum, uh, the so-called uh, card pole problem, um, which is, yeah, I mean, that's exactly the inverse pendulum. So you have such a pendulum, and now the task is to swing it up and control it in the upright position. <laughs> um, and I mean, this is a classical uh, problem in control theory, and people in control theory, they model this pendulum. There is a differential equation, and this can be solved. And uh, uh, using this model, people develop a controller to control this inverse pendulum. But the advantage if you use reinforcement learning is no engineer has to develop a controller. You just use your reinforcement learning algorithm and it will learn to control the pendulum. And I mean, this task has been solved perfectly with reinforcement learning now. Now people work on the double inverted pendulum. Also, they also already solved it with reinforcement learning. And the double pendulum, so yeah, let, let's first show you uh, the the, the ordinary inverse pendulum. It, it's the so-called card pole problem. So you have a card moving along a one-dimensional rail, and on the card there is attached this pole. Yeah? And the goal is to swing up this pole, uh, and the only actions of the card are to move to the right, move to the left, or make no moves. Yeah? And uh, I mean, that's what I showed you. 
And now the double, the double pendulum is, you have a double pendulum. So there is a, a joint here, and the goal is to finally get it in the upright position. And this is, of course, much harder. I mean, I cannot imagine for me to solve the double, uh, the double pendulum. The single pendulum is no problem for us. Huh? But the double pendulum, I would have no chance to get this controlled. OK, yeah, I mean, there are many other applications. For example, the control of a quadrocopter. Um, I mean, in the, in the group of Professor Force, they worked on quadrocopter control. And there was a student, a Haitam Buama, uh, who in his master thesis used reinforcement learning to control such a quadrocopter um, in order to fly stable. The problem with all helicopters is stability. So it, it, may, it may just uh, flip around and then crash. And controlling it in the horizontal position is one of the problems. And he solved it with reinforcement learning. Yeah, OK. Um, and I will, I will now, in, on the next few slides, show you a really nice and funny uh, application in, in aerodynamics. But before, let me talk about the problems. The problems in robotics are um, high dimensional spaces. Um, I mean, look, these benchmarks, the spaces are not too high dimensional. Huh? If I take the single pendulum, then uh, the ordinary card pole, then the state is the state of the system consists of the angle of the pendulum, phi, uh, then maybe we would use phi dot, which is the angular velocity. Um, then, of course, we need the position of the card, x, and maybe x dot. Yeah? These are the four variables of the state. So the state space is four-dimensional. The action space is one-dimensional. We, we only have three actions. So this is, not, uh, this is quite a small uh, state space. Yeah? And if in, the, in case of the double uh, pendulum, of course, we get this, uh, let's call it psi and psi dot. So now we are in a six-dimensional state space. Um, and, I mean, two extra dimensions makes the problem really harder. But now, uh, let's look at realistic rob uh, robotics applications. Like, for example, such a, robo a RoboCup a robot, or maybe even a humanoid robot. And that's, I mean, uh, that's extreme. Uh, a humanoid robot typically has something between 40 and 50 joints. That means a 40 to 50 dimensional state space. And there is nowadays no chance to solve with reinforcement learning such high dimensional problems. Yeah? I mean, that's what we call, this problem is called the curse of dimensionality. Maybe you remember what I showed you in the beginning uh, when, we, when we started. Let me go back a couple of slides and show you this slide again. And now we are back, yeah. We are back at this point. Where was that? Let me see. Oh, no. Here, that was the slide. I mean, the task of a, of a reinforcement learning agent is to find an optimal policy. So it's a search problem to find out of a large number of policies one optimal policy. And the number of policies, here you see a formula how the number of policies grows um, with the number of dimensions. No, I, you don't see the, the, the dimensions. Yeah? We, I mean, we have a two-dimensional state space. So the number of dimensions is fixed. Yeah? 
So what you see here is how the number of policies grows with the number of discrete states in each dimension. But now if you would add a third dimension, uh, then you would see, uh, can we see it with this formula? Yeah, I mean I don't want to go into the detail, but here you see nx times ny. Yeah? And this occurs in the, expo in the exponent. Yeah? So in the exponent we do have a product of all the dimensions and that means um, when we increase the number of dimensions we would have a um, double exponentially growing function and that's extremely worse. Yeah? Uh, a double exponential uh, complexity that's really bad and that's the problem why we can't solve high dimensional problems in reinforcement learning now. That's what we call the so-called curse of dimensionality. Yeah. So where are we? Here. Okay. Another problem in robotics is, I mean in robotics compared to simulation. Look at these nice benchmarks like that. So, uh, such a problem like the card pole problem will typically be solved in simulation. We will simulate it on the computer, that's no problem because um, we do have either this, uh, the differential equation for modeling the system or we nowadays we have good physics simulators on the computer. So we simulate the whole system on the computer and then we can do reinforcement learning just on the computer without having to bother with hardware, develop the hardware and maybe having problems with, with the hardware. But the major problem is uh, if I do this in the real world then it takes a certain time between action number one and two and so on. The time between two possible actions is in the order of seconds. Maybe, maybe here it's one second, maybe a tenth of a second, but it's a lot of time. In the computer simulation it's maybe a factor of, tau of thousand faster. So I immediately gain a factor of 1,000, maybe even 10,000 in speed. And that's what I lose on real world robots. That's the problem. Huh? Feedback of the environment on real robots is very slow. Sorry, not slowly, it's very slow. So we need, what we need is, we need better learning algorithms that don't need to collect so many data. We need learning algorithms that can learn very fastly, uh, they, which don't need so many cycles. Okay, yeah, and now let me show you an impressive, yeah, almost real world application of reinforcement learning. You see here, uh, this was uh, in a talk from Russ Tetrick, um, uh, a researcher from Canada. He showed this on the IROS in 2008. IROS is uh, one of the major uh, conferences on intelligent robots. Um, and uh, yeah, his task was landing of airplanes, uh, in particular, as you can see, landing on such an aircraft carrier. Uh, um, and the problem, of course, is that the runway is extremely short. It's actually too short for an airplane to land. Yeah? And therefore, they do have on the tail of the airplane such a hook and uh, on the ground there is such a steel wire and uh, hopefully this hook will really uh, catch the steel wire and then uh, everything works uh, out well. But if the airplane would not catch the wire, then these guys, they are in problem. Huh? Then either they, um, they can manage to, uh, to restart or it would uh, fall into the water. Um, so this is really not easy, but now look at how nature solves the problem. It's no problem at all. I mean, birds, they don't need an aircraft carrier to land. 
when they want to, to uh, catch some food from a tree or whatever. I mean, what a, what a bird does, it just opens its uh, wings and uh, uh, the, the result is it would stall. It would stall, that means the aerodynamics uh, immediately, um, so the aerodynamic flow around the wings would immediately stop and, and the bird can uh, stop extremely fast. Huh? Um, why is this not possible with airplanes? That's the problem. And the answer is written here. Birds don't solve Navier Stokes. I mean, that really impressed me. Um, there is a, a discipline which, uh, of, of engineers who only deal with, almost only deal with Navier Stokes, which is called aerodynamics. Uh, these are people who the Navier-Stokes is a, a partial differential equation which is used to model aerodynamic flow. Um, and uh, differential equations are uh, one of the ugly parts of mathematics. Yeah? Because, I mean, what you learn in lectures is typically to solve uh, linear differential equations with constant coefficients. But this is not realistic. In real world, uh, you do have nonlinear differential equations with non-constant coefficients and in high dimensions. And in high dimensions, that's what we call then partial differential equations. Uh, and such differential equations, they cannot be solved analytically no chance for analytical solution first. Okay, we do then solve them numerically. I will show you this next semester in the math lecture. But solving uh, partial differential equations numerically costs extremely much computational power first and second in critical situations such as this there is no chance to solve them numerically because um, there are kind of discontinuities in the functions and then um, it's impossible to solve them numerically. And because they can't solve these differential equations, they cannot model what happens when the bird opens its, its wings. I mean, the problem is the following. Um, if the wing of the bird or the airplane maybe looks like that, yeah? uh, or no, in, in, in ordinary uh, flying uh, situations, it's quite flat, it looks like that. Yeah? And then um, the air flows, we, you have a laminar flow of the air around the wing. Maybe you have a little bit higher pressure below the, the wing and a lower pressure above the wing, and that's why this moves uh, the bird or the airplane up. But as soon as you do something, so that means you put your wing like that, and then you get extremely turbulent uh, airflow here and here and here, and this is impossible to simulate. No chance to simulate this. Okay, so the conclusion is flying is impossible. No, it's not. You, if you look at birds, it works. Even though they don't study aerodynamics, they don't solve partial differential equations, it's possible. And how is it possible? It's possible by trial and error. They just learn it. And if the birds are able to learn it, why shouldn't computers be able to learn it? And that's what, uh, what he did. He used such a tiny little airplane, size about like that, uh, made of uh, styrofoam. It had, uh, the, I mean, this little airplane had no engine, but it had a remote control. Uh, a remote control, but only for this, uh, for this wing here. So th th he could just move this rear wing up and down. And now the goal was for this airplane to land 
on a stick like that. Yeah? So they had a room like this, and on, on this end of the room, they they just throw this airplane into the room, and then it uh, sail. What is sail? Sail? Segelflugzeug? What is that in English? So it just flew uh, through the whole room, and on the other end of the room, there was a line like this. Yeah? So they just used a clothesline uh, across the room, and the goal of the airplane was to land on this clothesline. Here you can see it. So it just flies through the room, and then this rear wing had to be moved such that at this point here, right at the clothesline, um, the speed should be, it should end up here with zero speed. And then here on, in the front, there is a little hook, so it just uh, stops with the hook here on the line. And now, of course, there is no computer on, the, on this little plane, but it was remotely controlled. So what they used is, they used uh, such a motion capture camera, uh, and so this camera from the side it sees the airplane, the position, and the angle of the airplane plane and, the, and the speed all the time, and it would control this rear wing such that it ends up with a speed of zero here. It took him around 200 trials. So 200 times they had to throw this little airplane into the room, and then with high probability it could land at this point. Nobody solved any Navier-Stokes equations. I mean, that's really impressive. And that's a proof of the power of reinforcement learning. Because here, he solved with reinforcement learning a problem that no engineer could solve before. Okay, yeah, the curse of dimensionality. We already talked about this. Um, and now the question is, how could we um, try to solve this problem? Uh, so the problem is high dimensional state and action spaces. Uh, um, and now, in, in my group here, uh, in our ZIFR project, we work exactly on this problem, because our goal is to solve real world problems, which are high dimensional. Uh, so now, um, there is the fact that in nature, learning happens on many abstraction levels. Take a, a child that first, during the first few years, uh, children learn basic low-level motion skills, like walking, like moving the head, like moving hands, and so on. And once these basic motion skills work well, then they are kind of stored. They are encapsulated, and then there is this command walk in this direction, and I don't have to think about it, it just works. And then I can start learning skills on a higher level, yeah? solving problems and so on. Yeah? Um, and and that's, that's one of the tasks in our project. We now work on learning on different abstraction levels. So first we learn the low level skills, and then on the next level we learn higher level skills. We learn to plan action sequences. Um, that's very important because I mean, if you would like to uh, use just one reinforcement learning algorithm to learn everything on your agent, it's impossible. It's way too complex. I mean, it's, it's related to software engineering. I mean, nobody would, uh, tr would solve a really hard software development problem by just writing one uh, thread of code. Of course, you have to modularize your system and uh, find a good architecture, many modules, hierarchical structure, and so on. And then you would get a good, uh, um, finally, a good policy. Yeah? And that's what we also do, hierarchical layers of uh, learning modules. 
Um, yeah. And then, of course, the action space is scaled down yeah? because any little module has a much uh, smaller state and action space. Okay, yeah, I mean, there is a, a whole uh, almost discipline about hierarchical learning. Yeah, and there is also now this area called distributed learning where people try to use kind of many brains to solve one problem. An example is the centipede. In German, that's a thousand Füßler. Um, and these centipedes, they don't have one brain to control 100 or 1,000 legs. No, they have, for every pair of legs, they have this little brain uh, that controls these two legs. And this little brain has connections to the, to the neighboring brains for the next two, uh, next uh, pairs of legs. Uh, and so we have a distributed uh, brain and distributed learning algorithm. But this is uh, still in the very beginnings, this research. Yeah. Okay, yeah, other ideas. Um, First of all, and this is a major problem for us uh, AI researchers, the human brain at birth is no tabula rasa. So there is, of course, pre-wiring in the brain. There are already stored skills in the brain. Huh? Okay, but from this we should learn. We should not try to start with the tabula rasa and learn everything from scratch. Maybe we should combine machine learning techniques with classical programming techniques, for example. Uh, so on our robot, we first do the classical programming as good as we can, and then on top of this already good policy, we try to improve such a policy with reinforcement learning. Uh, and also, additionally, maybe the reinforcement learning still is not perfect, but then we use a human trainer that gives our learning algorithm additional feedback. Um, and this additional feedback from human trainers is extremely helpful. You just have to look at what happens in sports. Of course, all the athletes, they have their human trainer who gives them feedback. And that's what we also do in robotics. Yeah? Uh, so this, this procedure, that's what happens in my group here. Uh, or another approach that we also follow is we first do learning from demonstration. I mean, that's supervised learning. We just first do supervised learning. But, I mean, that means we have in our training data to provide the action labels. Somebody has to provide the action labels. Um, but, I mean, we found methods to do this a human demonstrates the task, the robot watches the human and then tries to copy the policy. That works very well. You can see it uh, in the lab on our robot. And then in the next step, we are currently working on this, we try to improve this policy by reinforcement learning. And then in the third step, like here, um, additional trainer feedback. And this would reduce um, the learning problem dramatically because the search space is much smaller. When I already have a good policy, I just have to improve it a little bit um, and the search space is much smaller. Okay, yeah. Um, and of course, I just told you a very little bit about this area of reinforcement learning. There are so many uh, different new algorithms one, for example, is called fitted value iteration. Uh, I mean, it, I mentioned it. That's where you use a neural network, for example, to store the Q functions, then connecting reinforcement learning with imitation learning. That's what I used saw on the, on the slide before. Then there are so-called policy gradient methods. That's a completely different approach to reinforcement learning. What we have seen is we use a value function or a Q function to store the cumulative reward. And based on these Q functions, 
we will get the policies. But the policy gradient methods, they directly store the policy in a function and now we want to improve the policy. Yeah? Um, so we have a, um, an objective function that measures the quality of our policy on the, and, and on this objective function we do um, gradient ascent. So we, we are searching a point where the policy gives um, uh, best feedback. Uh? Um, yeah, so gradient ascent or gradient descent methods and a variant of this are the actor critic methods and also another variant are natural gradient methods and a new approach which I don't have on the slides yet is the dynamic uh, motor primitives learning that's an, uh, an interesting new approach. So you see it's an ongoing, very interesting field, um, which is mathematically not too easy. Okay, yeah, I mean, this is the fitted value iteration algorithm, but I, I'll just skip this and I don't go into the detail. And we are working here in my project on developing uh, the teaching box, which is a Java software package involving a couple of different reinforcement learning algorithms, supervised learning algorithms. We also have environments in it. Yeah. And yeah, last, some uh, hints to the literature. I mean, on reinforcement learning, this book, Sutton Barto Reinforcement Learning. Oh, I just forgot it. I wanted to bring it. Uh, this is the standard uh, literature. But as you can see here, um, it's a little bit outdated, but as a first literature, that's the book to read. Yeah. And of course, there is lots of new literature uh, on uh, reinforcement learning, but the Sutton Bartow book is the primary reference. Okay, so yeah, that's all about reinforcement learning. Any questions to this chapter? Okay, so uh, yes, so now let's uh, go into the recommender systems chapter. Yeah. Um, yes, okay. Here I have a, a book, it's a German book, Empfehlungssysteme. Uh, you can have a look at it if you want. And I forgot to bring you a nice article, but I, I will send you this as a PDF per email. Um, it's a something like 15 pages article um, with an explanation of some simple recommender system algorithms and a comparison of these algorithms. Okay, recommender systems. Um, I mean, that's an application of machine learning and that's why it fits very well here. Um, and the goal is to recommend products to customers. Yeah? Um, and I mean, you know this from uh, internet shops like Amazon. And I mean, here I listed some of the phrases that you can see when you, when you shop uh, with Amazon. Customers who bought items in your recent history also bought this. What other customers are looking at right now? Frequently bought together. So that means you will then have a list of three books and Amazon tells you frequently bought together are this book and this book and that book and more items to consider. Customers who bought this item also bought, cost customers also bought items by. What other items do customers buy after viewing this item? And so on. And then list mania. They even show you the lists of recommended books of other users and so on. Yeah? Okay. I mean, for most of these 
recommendations. There are obvious, simple ideas about how uh, they could recommend this. Yeah? Um, I mean, it's more or less a matter of a good database that stores uh, what users bought. But of course, they want to optimize this. They want to have optimal recommendations for the customers um, because that brings a lot of money. Okay, um, yeah. And such recommender systems, this is its own discipline nowadays in AI or machine learning. Um, and there are books about this. And this is not the only book. There are many books, meanwhile, about recommender systems. Um, and so the class of algorithms, they are roughly split into two uh, fields. First is so-called collaborative filtering and the second content-based filtering. Collaborative filtering is recommendations based on what other users bought. Huh? So they, they look what other users did and try to infer what might be uh, good for you. Yeah? I mean, the simplest thing is uh, they look at the high score list of the most frequently bought products and they would recommend you the most frequent products. I mean, for me, that wouldn't be helpful because the most frequent books in Amazon are some uh, uh, novels, uh, maybe crime or love stories and I wouldn't read it. Uh, so that wouldn't be very helpful for me. Uh, so maybe we should uh, use something better. Huh? And the idea is to look at similar users. So they would recommend me books that users read with a similar profile, uh, similar to mine. Huh? Okay, this is collaborative filtering and content-based filtering. Um, here, we don't look at other users. Other users are not relevant at all. We just look at similar products. Okay, we, I will uh, start with collaborative filtering. So the first thing, of course, is to store uh, information about purchases of many customers. Um, so we have capital M consumers C1 through CM, and we have N products, P1 through PN. And now there is this interaction matrix. Um, so here we have all the products, and here we have all the customers, and when customer 1 buys product P1, we just enter a 1 here. And when customer 1 buys product P3, we enter a 1 here and so on. So we get a huge matrix. I mean, in case of Amazon, this is really a huge matrix. I have no idea, but of course there are millions, uh, uh, maybe even uh, billions of different books that Amazon sells. So this, is, this matrix is extremely wide. Um, and now if we look at customer number one, out of these millions of books, customer number one has maybe bought 10 books, maybe, maybe 100 books. But this, is, this means that in such a row, there are almost all zeros and a very few, very small number of ones. Yeah? Um, and the same thing with the columns. For a certain, for one of the books that Amazon sells, out of the millions of customers, only a tiny portion will have bought this book. Yeah? So this matrix is quite sparse. The number of ones uh, compared to the number of zeros is extremely small. Okay, so that's the first thing. And now here, in this example, in the matrix, there are only ones, no other uh, numbers. But this, of course, can be generalized. Um, so this matrix, the semantics of this matrix would be 
which customers have bought which books. Yeah? And we don't talk, I mean, it, I guess it doesn't occur very often that uh, a customer buys a book twice or maybe more than twice at Amazon. It may happen, and then we might enter not a one, but a ten here. But uh, that wouldn't actually be very helpful. But of course what's helpful for other customers is, and maybe that's not the case in Amazon, I don't think so, or, oh yes it is, uh, of course there are customer ratings of the books. Yeah? So customers do rate the books. Um, and now if there are ratings, customer ratings, then of course we wouldn't enter the one anymore. We would now enter the number of stars the customer gives to the books. I mean it's between zero and five stars I guess in Amazon. So then there would be a number between zero and five and that of course would be uh, even more helpful for other customers. Huh? So we can either just enter the ones or we can either uh, we can enter the number of stars the customer gives to the products. In, in my example, I just uh, used it with the ones here. Okay, yeah, and now we talk about the first algorithm which is called the user-based algorithm. Yeah? Um, here we have the interaction matrix again and here we have uh, the consumer similarity matrix. I will show you in a few minutes uh, how to compute these uh, values here. Um, what we have here is, look, this is a, a matrix where we have all the customers here and all the customers here. And such an entry, for example, this entry here, um, yeah, this entry is the relation between customer 7 and customer 5. Huh? Um, and this number illustrates the similarity of the two customers. Such, so that means customer 7 and 5, they are more similar than customer 7 and customer 4. Or maybe customer 9 and customer 3, they have a zero here. So they are uh, very different. And this of course is very helpful to know how similar customers are. And now the first question is how to compute such a similarity measure of customers. And there are many different ways to do this. Uh, I just show you one example how I intuitively imagined how, we, how I could do it. Yeah? And this can be done by uh, computing the correlation coefficient. We had it already in this lecture when we talked at the beginning of the, the probability chapter. Yeah? But let me, let me recall it. Um, so the, 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 the core of the correlation coefficient is the, the covariance, sigma ij. So we are talking about the similarity of customer i and customer J. Um, and now this capital A is our uh, interaction matrix. This is our interaction matrix. Um, and uh, so in this interaction matrix, the, the profile of customer one is this row here. And the profile of customer five is this row here. And the question is, to, to find out whether, it, whether customer 5 and 1 are similar, I have to compare this row vector with this row vector. Yeah? That's, that's the point. Yeah? And uh, in the correlation coefficients, I first calculate the, the mean, the mean of customer 1 yeah? and the mean of customer 5 that's what we have here. AI mean. That's the mean over a row number I. So this is, for example, for customer one, the mean. And then AIP, which is the difference between the items and the mean. And this for the other customer two. And then the product. 
So this means if this is positive and this is negative, then we have a so-called anti-correlation of these two products. And then we do the sum over all products, and that's the, the uh, covariance. Um, and, but now the covariance is not so good a measure because the covariance depends on the absolute value of the items. I mean, here it wouldn't be m uh, much of a problem because we only have ones and zeros. But as soon as we enter a star rating, then maybe customer one only gives ratings between zero and two, and the other customer between zero and five. Uh, and now we would have to normalize the whole thing. And this normalization occurs here. The correlation coefficient is normalized, so we only get correlation coefficients between minus one and plus one. Okay, but now, I mean, that's a, the, the problem is we want to come to a similarity measure which should be between zero and one. So now we have to map this, uh, this interval minus one, one to an interval zero, one, and that's why now we take our correlation coefficient at one and divide it by two, uh, so then now this new uh, measure um, is a value between zero and one. Uh, and one means two customers, I and J, are very similar, and zero means they are not similar at all. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, and, and this is the source code for an Octave program. So there is this correlation function. I just take the matrix A and transpose it, and I enter this two times plus one divided by two, and that's how we get this uh, WC matrix, and that's what we have here. That's how I calculated this matrix, the so-called consumer similarity matrix. Okay, yeah. And now, uh, the next step is we just multiply our consumer similarity matrix with the interaction matrix. Yeah? Um, and so we get an, we get now a new matrix as a result which is, uh, which contains the recommendation scores. Now look, uh, we multiply from the left, our consumer similarity matrix to this matrix. Yeah? What would we get as a result? So, um, yeah. Now let's try to, to uh, illustrate it here. So we multiply the consumer similarity matrix here, um, and this is. Um, a 10 by 10 matrix, yeah? because we have 10, 10, 10 consumers, you see here. 10 consumers, 6 products, and here we multiply with a 10 by 10 matrix, so then we get here as a result, um, what do we get as a result here? We get a 10 by 6 matrix. Yeah. And that's what we have here. Ten rows, six columns. Uh, um, and what does it contain? You know, we can go back to... Um, what does this contain? So still we have here the customers, and here we have the products, and these, these values here are the recommendation scores for the products. So now the idea is what product would this recommender system recommend to customer number one? We just have to look at these scores. So the first recommendation would be this with the highest number. This would be the second recommendation and so on for the other customers. So, and uh, the, the, uh, the numbers highlighted in red are the biggest and the blue ones are the second biggest. So, if we would recommend 
uh, two or three items, then we would, I mean, here you see uh, so the highest score occurs twice, so we have three recommendations for this customer here. Yeah. So that's a, a very, very simple algorithm. It's really simple. So what we have to do is to compute the correlation matrix uh, um, based on the interaction matrix and then just compute this simple product of the uh, consumer similarity matrix with the interaction matrix and we get our recommendation scores. Uh? Yeah, that's really simple. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a nice idea. Uh, the idea is to use the other customers uh, to recommend products for me. So we don't, we don't go into semantics and analyze products and properties of products, nothing like that. It's just a statistics of what other customers bought or uh, what are their ratings? Okay, yeah, and uh, sorry, what was that? Oh, irgendwas schief gegangen. Yeah. Okay, now let's look at this uh, second algorithm, which is quite similar but a little bit different. It's the so-called item-based algorithm and I mean of course if we can uh, compute a correlation matrix for consumers we can also compute a correlation matrix for items. So here the question is how similar is product P1 to product P4 for example? And this similarity is based on do the same customers buy this product and this product? Um, yeah, let me see. Are there similar products here? Maybe product one and three because these five customers, they all bought this. Okay, there is some difference here. Yeah. Okay, and so we get a product similarity matrix now and the procedure is the same, just that we, I mean, before we compute the correlation coefficient, we would transpose this matrix and could apply the same algorithm. Exactly the same thing, just transposing this matrix before computing the correlation coefficients, and then we get this, this six by six, six matrix uh, with the product similarities. And, uh, okay, we, we can skip this because it's the same formulas. And now what we do is we multiply our interaction matrix from the right with the product similarity matrix and now we get uh, these recommendation scores. And again, it's a, a 10 by 6 matrix so um, again we take the maximum of the rows which tells me I would recommend this item um, to customer one and maybe this one and maybe that one and the same thing for the other customers. Yeah. So these are the two simplest algorithms for uh, recommending products to customers. And they do consider either uh, consumer similarities or product similarities. Uh, yes. And I mean the question is whether, whether uh, to use this, uh, the item based or the uh, consumer based algorithm it's not really easy to answer. In some extreme cases, it's obvious. For example, suppose um, we have a small number of products. Maybe only six products, but millions of customers. 
then of course we get a much better statistics if we compute the product similarity matrix because the columns are very long. Yeah? So from the long columns we get good statistics in computing the product correlations. But we would get bad statistics when we would compute uh, consumer similarities. So in such a case where the number of products is small but the number of customers is large, then of course we would use the item-based algorithm which is based on the product similarities. In the other extreme case where the number of customers is small but the number of products is large, then of course we would use the consumer-based algorithm where we compute the, the customer similarities. But, I mean, in case of Amazon, both is very large. We have millions of products and millions of customers, so we can use both algorithms. And it's kind of, I mean, they, sh they should just try it out. Yeah? And of course they do it. And I will send you this paper with these algorithms and with the comparison of the algorithms. And in this paper you can see they tried these algorithms on three different domains. One domain was movie rating, another domain was a bookstore, and the third domain I don't remember. And what you see is it's kind of different. Yeah? On this application this algorithm is better and the next algor application another algorithm is better. So it's not easy to, uh, to choose which, uh, which one is the best algorithm. Okay, yeah, and now uh, let me uh, start with a, a third algorithm, the so-called link analysis algorithm. Um, yeah. Again, we do have products and we do have consumers. But now, um, at least to understand the algorithm, we represent the relation between products and consumers um, in such a graph. So we have the consumer nodes, we have the product nodes, and now we have links in between the consumer nodes and the product nodes. Um, so for example, if our consumer number one buys product two and product four, then we get these two links. And if, it, uh, if this customer does not buy product one, we have no link. Of course, we can uh, now, if we have the star ratings, then uh, such a link would be associated with, uh, with a weight corresponding to the rating. So if customer 2 rates product P4 with the value A24, then this is the rating value. So it's, yeah, I mean, these, these links, they just contain the weights. Yeah. Ah, yeah, and I should also mention that this link analysis algorithm was developed in, uh, in a different context. It was actually developed for search engines on the web like Google uh, because for search engines it is important to have a rating, a weight for links to see whether a link is important or not. Um, and so now if if uh, a search engine has uh, weighted links, um, then the weight of a link uh, may have an influence on the weighting of uh, some website that uh, the search engine shows to the user. And of course, uh, what's very important is an ordering of the websites that Google presents you. And this ordering of the websites is based on such a link rating and they use the so-called link analysis algorithm. And a variant of this link analysis algorithm nowadays is used for recommender systems. But now we don't have websites here and there. We have consumers here and products here and the links are uh, the relations between consumers and products. Okay. 
Yes, so now the question is whether we should go into this algorithm. No, I guess we stop here and uh, have another lecture about the rest of the recommender systems. Um, yes.